Socrates, Seth, Volume 1, Volume 2, and Volume 3, and Tuthmosis. What are you doing here? T, 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 T. I'm going to put you where you belong. So when we talk about legacy, um, what comes to mind when you hear the word legacy? Maybe a lot of things kind of flash in your mind. You might think of, uh, oh, and by the way, that picture is, is for those of you that have been following the Facebook obsession that I've been seeing lately, and that is uh, it's kind of a Where's Waldo picture. Uh, when <laughs> so when my dad was at the, at the, toward the end of his life, and he had Alzheimer's, we walked by that giant picture in the hallway, and he looks and he goes, now that's your grandfather in that picture, almost the spot where Bernie is. And so, <laughs> now you get it, okay. So anyway, he, he looked at that and he says, yeah, that was your grandfather on there, and that was such, such a place. And I said, I don't know, that looks like New York to me in the background, but I didn't want to argue with him he says yeah he had a really great he was really great with heights and he's kind of elaborating on this picture you know that it was my grandfather in the picture I had to go look it up and study it just to make sure that it was you know a made up memory <laughs> but anyway I, I love that picture I think of my grandpa <laughs> okay so what comes to mind when you hear the word legacy and it's really a word that's used a lot. It's used everywhere. I'm going to touch on that in a moment. It's, it's a word that's used frequently in our culture, which is really kind of interesting, more so than I remember in the past. Uh, you have, you know, a legacy car. You have, I think I have a, do I have a graphic picture of all these different? I guess that'll come in a minute. But let's, let's talk about what is a legacy. Legacy, if you look at just the, the raw definition, is Money or property bequeathed to another by will. So you say, well, they are leaving a legacy. They are leaving an inheritance. The second meaning is something handed down from an ancestor or a predecessor from the past. So this may not be money per se. It could be a number of things, and it becomes part of their legacy, part of represents their life and something of value that they're passing on to you. And so when you look at for instance, somebody may leave a legacy of religious freedom. So we have a legacy of religious freedom in our country. And so it can be a gift. It can be a bequest, an inheritance. So, so when we talk about living a life of significance, so significance, what does significance even mean? And I, I started kind of breaking these down. It means consequential. It means momentous. It means weighty, having meaning, likely to have influence or effect. It's important, living a life of importance, living a life of meaning and consequence, living a life that's momentous and weighty. Don't we all deep in our hearts want to live a life that we, you know, I mean, I think that was something real strong in my generation coming up through the, the 70s and 80s. It was really strong in our DNA that was fundamentally we wanted to make a difference. We wanted to make the world a better place. I think the millennial and Gen Z generation has that pretty strong today. They really want the world to be a better place, and sometimes maybe misdirected. And, and by the way, uh, I may mention this in a little bit, but you realize educa in the educational system, the reason series like we're doing are so important is that you have, for instance, right now, the 1619 Project being pushed hard through our institutions and colleges and public schools. And so some legislatures, and there's been some law, some legal work done to create an alternate project called 1776, 
which reflects more on the virtues of American history. And so, but I'll, I'll just tell you right now, the 1619 Project is really, really bad. And it's, it is indoctrinating an entire generation of young people to hate America. And so when we do a series like we're doing right now called America, Imagine the World Without Her, it's so important that parents are informed and that they're alert and that you're having conversations with your children and that you are aware of what they're learning and what they're, there, there's never been a time that you need to be engaged as parents in the kind of influence that your children are experiencing in, in, in school, in college, in their educational circle. You know, we get them, we get them for a few minutes, we get them for a little bit of time from a church standpoint or family standpoint, but the public school system gets them for 40 hours a week. And it's difficult to compete with that. That's why I think the homeschooling movement has taken on entirely uh, new traction than it had in the past because parents are reacting and they're realizing, you know what, they're after the minds and hearts of my kids. And unless I do something drastic or I begin to make some real changes to circle the wagons and begin to protect our kids. And, and homeschooling is just is such a powerful alternative. If you can afford a private education, that's good too. But I really want to challenge a lot of you parents that just think the public schools are by default virtuous. You need to rethink that. So, and if you have your kids in public school and you feel you have no alternative, you need to really be having conversations and paying attention to everything they're learning. So that's why we're offering things like this as a resource on Wednesday nights. Parents should be here. We provide child care. You should be getting your mind, make sure that you're clear in your thoughts so that you have an alternate view of reality than what we, what we want is reality. We don't want the narrative that's necessarily being forced down our throats that's from a twisted kind of progressive Marxist twist to it. So... A lot of times what we can have is tunnel vision in the way that we approach our lives. So often we progress through life. The things that matter seem so immediate and often so trivial. How do we move toward building a legacy while journeying through a life often dominated by things that don't seem to matter? Much in the grand, uh, these, these things, I mean, we're all involved in these things day to day that don't seem to matter in the grand scheme of things. So how in the, in the kind of micro decisions we're all making from day to day and week to week, how does that, how does that affect a legacy? How does that affect the long-term picture of how our lives are going to turn out and what we're going to have to leave behind? And so I know, and listen, I know I'm talking about this. A lot of young people are sitting here going, I'll worry about legacy later. I'll worry, <laughs> you know, it's like, listen, listen, legacy is on a lot of different spheres on a lot of different scales. So you can, you can leave a, you can be a part of a fellowship and leave a legacy. You say, well, we're moving to Austin and, you know, we've been in the net for five years. What was your legacy? See? And so there are, there are a lot of things that we're doing through our lives. That it's not necessarily what happens when you die. It's about how we're choosing to live our lives and how we're investing in those lives. What are our priorities? What are our passions? What, are our, what is our love? I remember talking about tunnel vision. I remember Nathan one day. He's back there in the AV booth. He was a very motivated kid. I mean, he was the climber. He's the one we had to teach how to get down from the fort early, like one and a half, two. You're like, he can get up there quick. It's like a lot of things, accidents happen when you're coming down, not when you're going up, I can tell you. And so, yeah, Kristen, Kristen broke her ankle in Big Bend about three years ago. Was it going down or going up? It was going down, see? And so I thought, okay, I'm going to I'm gonna have to teach Nathan how to go down. He goes up that thing really quick, but how is he going to come back down? So I wanted to empower him. So he was the adventurer. I mean, all of my kids were adventurous, but I mean, but he was just wired. Anything that showed, you know, like this would be something to chat. This would be something to conquer. I mean, he'd be up there and then dangling all the way across. I mean, this kid was like half monkey. He was born with washboard abs. <laughs> I, I'm serious. I'm like, you know, some people work all their lives with these things. This kid was born with them. How does that even happen? And so, so he... Uh, so we were out at the, what they call in Portland, we used to live in Portland, it was a, what they called the sand dunes, which weren't really sand at all. They were just clay mounds of dirt and mud that were hard. And so, but they, had, they were erosional remnants, so they had kind of a hilly thing to it. And there was one that kind of went up and it was going down. There was another one, these hills. 
And he was up there on his bicycle. And he had this moment where he's thinking, I think I can jump this. I think I can jump this. And it was one of those just moments of wisdom that came over him. And he decided, I don't know why. I don't know what possessed him. He had a doubt that maybe the aerodynamics weren't what he thinks. So he says, Mom, Dad, what do you think? Can I, do you think I can make it? And we're like, ah! no. I mean, we can see ourselves in the ER quick. You know, like, this kid is not going to fly across. He had tunnel vision. He could see, all he could see was that. But he had a moment where he's just kind of broadening his perspective. Like, maybe Mom and Dad might have some input right now that could be really helpful. So fortunately, we stopped him and avoided another ER visit. Uh, it's so, in other words, it's very difficult for young adults, Gen Z especially, the, the younger they are, it's very difficult for them to picture 10 years from now. Me, I can picture 10 years from now. You can maybe picture. But, but young people, they really have a hard time conceptualizing what is my life going to be like in 10 years. They might be able to conceptualize if I can just get through college or if I can just pass the next semester, or if I can just... But to think in terms of decisions they're making, they will make so many crucial decisions over the next 10 years. All the big decisions of life, really, to some extent, will be made within that, that brief 10-year period. So they've got... They've, they'll probably very likely choose who they're going to marry and, and uh, settle down with the rest of their lives. They're going to probably decide on their faith will become settled during that time. They will decide on their career during that time. You realize that if they can settle those three things, they pretty, I mean, and get it right, they pretty much have gotten 70, 80% of life down. I know you want to study to verify that 70, 80%. I don't have one. But it's true. Okay. So it is very difficult. And so, so I'm going to try to, this message will be relevant at some point. It will apply to all of us because it is about how we invest our lives and our priorities your legacy let's listen carefully to this statement your legacy is about how you choose to invest your life it is about what you ultimately value and care about most more broadly it's about what you leave behind when you leave a place For instance, James Dobson made the comment, a good father will leave his imprint on his daughter for the rest of her life. Okay, so all that relationship building, all that modeling, all the interactions, everything that happens throughout their life, their formative years, are going to leave a lasting imprint on the young lady and how the father relates to them. In other words, that legacy is being built while the child is growing up. And that child will carry that. So that father is leaving a deposit within the heart and soul and makeup of that young, young girl. So I want to look at a, a few scriptures. One is Luke, when Jesus talked about, really this is a scripture about legacy. It says, someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus says, man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter between you? And he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in abundance of possessions. So then he tells them, kind of dovetailing on that conversation he was having, he dovetails into this parable. Famous parable. It's going to be very familiar to almost everybody here. He says, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then, who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. So obviously laying a foundation that it's important that we're rich toward God. I don't think he's necessarily saying you shouldn't have things or abundance or, or 
provide and choose a good career path, and those are all part of the life struggles that are virtuous. But it's really about living a life that's in balance and a life that has, has the right priorities. If we're talking about leaving a legacy, it affects this life or the next life. And that's what he's saying. Jesus is saying this man invested everything in his life about this life and he had nothing in the next life. So a man may leave a fortune behind to build a hospital. That would become his legacy. Or maybe he leaves a fortune behind for wounded warriors. There's lots of different things that people will do and they know that that legacy will last and live on after they die. It will benefit many, many people, maybe for generations. A grandmother may leave behind a college fund for her granddaughter. She's left a legacy for the granddaughter's education. A researcher may leave behind a cure for a horrible disease, vastly improving the quality of life for many people. They have left a legacy. A missionary may spend years of his life translating the Bible in a remote tribal language and then leaves that tribal and then the tribe is left with the Word of God, which then lives on for generations. These things are all real. These things happen really all, a lot all, all the time. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to deviate just slightly because as I go into the series, there's some foundational principles or concepts I want you to get. And this one I'm going to kind of barrel into a little bit, and I'm going to really bring some scripture to bear. So if I'm bringing a concept that's new to you, just, just hold it, have an open heart, have a teachable spirit, and consider what the scripture is actually saying. But I want us to understand the role of counterfactuals. Say, counterfactuals? What on earth? That sounds like counterintuitive or a lot of other things. What is a counterfactual? And here's what I want you to get. Counterfactuals, you know, as much as Hollywood gets right, wrong in so many of their productions, there are few things that they get right. There, and I'm, I'm not talking about always, but there's a few things that they actually will, will convey certain ideas and values that they will actually convey repeatedly over generations that they kind of get right. One of them is that they don't like tyranny in the movies. They're always fighting tyranny. They're always fighting a dictator. They're always fighting someone who wants to take over the world and, and control everybody and, and, you know, Big Brother and the Beast and all these things. Hollywood has a, a knack for being able to identify diabolical evil in contrast to the good guy. And we still see that. Just watch the Marvel series, okay? On and on you see this conveyed. You also see the, the idea of actual real diabolical evil in the hearts and motivations of human beings. And that is actually real. So one of the other things that they convey is also the idea of free will, which is taught almost unthinkingly in Hollywood, and that's the idea that people make choices and there are consequences for those choices and that they have uh, a personal responsibility. And so, there, so many, many films and things that are done will be over an issue of justice or injustice or something to that effect. And then how often we'll watch a show and what we want is closure. We want to see that justice has been done. We want to see the bad guys are, are held accountable finally or whatever it happens to be. And there's this sense of in, that they're appealing to a deep uh, human need that we are all wanting to see justice. So a counterfactual, if I could put it in just the most layman terms possible, is essentially a what if. What if. So in other words, the idea is that your life has a trajectory and that if you make a choice, you make some choices, say, say you decide, I'm going to get an engineering degree. Well, that opens up that, that choice. If you achieve that degree, then that choice opens up possibilities for you when you graduate that you wouldn't have had otherwise. So you could look at that and go, what if you hadn't uh, gotten your engineering degree, then there would be another set of choices that then you would try to, to, to maximize. Okay, so that would be a what if. So you can think, well, I'm really glad I got that engineering degree. I don't have an engineering degree, but, you, but a person that gets one might think, well, I'm really glad we have a number of engineers here so I can pick on them. So a, a lot of times people think, well, I'm sure glad I got that engineering degree because everybody else is losing their jobs and I'm not. See, so the what if, I think, what would my life have been like? What would your life have been like if you hadn't followed Christ, if you had just continued another path? 
And I remember years ago, in fact, she's, she's not here today. She, uh, she got a little bug last week, so she's isolating. But Amanda, years ago, she moved here from Alabama. Is Amanda's mom here this morning? She's usually, usually here. Um, anyway, she had given this, she had like a dream or a vision, and the Lord showed her this is what your life would have been like if you had stayed in Alabama. He said, he showed her, he says, you would have married this person, you would have had this happen, and this would have been, you know, and so forth. He kind of laid it all out for her. And she was like, so, it made her so thankful for where she was right now, right here, and the path that she had chosen, and her walk with God, and so forth. She may have known the Lord in that other, other world, if you will. So that would be the what if, that would be a counterfactual. In other words, the Lord was speaking to Amanda and showing her this is how your life would have gone if you had stayed on that path. Now, this may seem a little contrary to ideas where we see history as purely static or all mapped out in the sense that it's a rigid, hardwired thing. And I obviously don't believe that history is entirely hardwired. I think some of it is hardwired. But I think some of, some of the choices we make are negotiable. And we'll see that as we look at Scripture. So what if our lives are not bound to a static, fatalistic destiny, but rather reflect a dynamic relationship with outcomes based on conditions created by our choices? Did you hear that? So I want chapter and verse. You'll get chapter and verse in just a second. I'm going to read that again. Our lives are not bound to a static, fatalistic destiny, but rather reflect a dynamic relationship with outcomes based on conditions created by our choices. Okay, so here's an example of a movie that illustrates X-Men, Days of Future Past. Any of you seen that one? So the entire movie is built on a single premise. The single premise is can the future be altered or is it already pre-written irresistibly? Very simple. The entire premise of the entire movie, all the way up to the very end, um, spoiler, is can they circumvent or change the outcome based on choices that they're making in the battle that they're fighting? Okay? So I'm rooting for, yes, the future can be altered. You're watching the movie like, yes, you can. You can change it. You can fight this. You can win, right? I'm not telling you whether they won or not. So you think how many movies or TV shows can you think of which the storyline alters the timeline of the past and future in some way? Now, I don't think you can alter the past <laughs> any way at all. It's done. It's behind us. All you have to do is watch that show, Stephen King. What was it called? Uh, the Langoliers. Nobody's here has seen the Langoliers, but it, sh it proves it proves the fact that you cannot change the past because these monsters that are assigned, I guess, by God or whatever, and these big monsters they eat the past. So, so if you're in the past, it, you will get eaten with it if you stay there very long. So you better get back in the present. So the past doesn't exist anymore. It's been eaten by the Langoliers. Oh, anyway, I have regressed. This is awful. Okay. So I listed, I listed a few TV shows that I've seen, and I love time travel and all that, and it's, it's all no fantasy, but uh, one, a couple of them that, that kind of deal with this space-time continuum, uh, and there are lots and lots of them. I, I did this little quiz with young adults, and they came up with 60 programs just like that. I mean, and timeless. Oh, wait, wait. One's called timeless. Frequency. Wayward Pines TV shows. TV show called 112263, Movies, Edge of Tomorrow, Deja Vu, Terminator, X-Men, almost all the X-Men, Men in Black, Back to the Future, all three of them, The Butterfly Effect, Need I Go On, but I'll tell you one of the best counterfactual movies ever in all time is It's a Wonderful Life. Ah, see there? So it's a wonderful life. What is the premise? The premise is, what would your life, what would, what would the world be like if you had never lived? What would the consequences have been? What was the ripple effect from the life that George Bailey was living? And so removing him from the equation 
And it takes him into this very surreal, strange world in which George Bailey wasn't present. And what would the world have been, the city have been, the, I don't remember the name of the town they were in, but it, it creates an entire scenario where he, he gets to see, he gets a glimpse. I thought, man, that would be cool to be able to see what would the world be like without you and then to find out it's so much better. <laughs> that would be really a down movie, wouldn't it? I mean, can you imagine? Yeah, think of how much better the world had been if you'd never been born. <laughs> I'm like, all right, so, so that, scratch that. I don't think that movie's ever been made. There you go. Somebody, some of you producers out there, there's your opportunity. So, so there, I think It's a Wonderful Life portrays very well this idea of a counterfactual. And uh, it makes a lot of fun with it. So here's, so where's counterfactual thinking in the Bible? Where does the concept come across in the Bible? It's very important we understand this because oftentimes people will be dismissive about their lives and their personal responsibility in their lives because they, they think, now here I want to make sure everybody understands, God is sovereign. He is the supreme sovereign of the universe. He has the last word on everything. However, he has set up the universe in his sovereignty in terms of jurisdictions. Now follow me on this. Meaning that, meaning that within jurisdictions, individuals have parameters. They have, they have uh, latitude. They have freedom to move and come about. And that goes to the heart and essence of free will and personal accountability. And why we will all face a judge one day. Because we have, uh, we have the ability as human beings to initiate and... Uh, direction in our lives with nothing behind the will causing us to do it that's why we have the essence of personal responsibility that's why god does judge humanity he not only judges humanity he judges nations it says that means that there's a collective sense of judgment that rests on us as a people so the united states of america has a collective responsibility in decisions we're making as a collective body uh, body politic but the reason it's so important to understand this is that oftentimes people will dismiss the weight of history and the weight of their own choices and the weight of the consequences of those choices because they have a concept of sovereignty that means, well, God's in control, so it doesn't really matter anyway. God is in control of what he's in control of. But nowhere in the Bible does it teach the idea that God is in control of everything. If he was in control of anything and everything, then why would he ever be grieved? Why would he ever be disappointed? Why would he ever be brokenhearted over choices that people are making? In other words, you look all through the Bible and you have to step back and go, God's looking on the earth and he's going, I don't like what I see. This is not what I did. This is not me. So we have to be careful that we don't slide into a kind of fatalistic view, well, after all, you know, well, it looks like the United States is headed to hell in a handbag, so I guess it doesn't matter because God is sovereign. That's a big mistake, I can tell you right now. Biblically, it's a big mistake. Okay, so here, here's some scripture. Deuteronomy 30, and I'm just giving you a few. They're like all over the Bible. They're like continuous. Counterfactual statements, what-if statements, if you will. Where God is saying, if you, if you make this choice, this will be the outcome. But if you make this choice, this will be the alternate outcome. So their future is determined by the choices they make. And it's over and over and over again. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. He says to Israel, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. That I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your seed may live. And he goes into a long exposition saying if you go the path of death and disobedience, then all these things will happen. If you go the path of life and obedience, then all these blessings will pursue you. So he, he literally lays out the what-if scenarios based on their choice. Proverbs 24, 14. Know also that, the, that wisdom is like honey for you. If you find it, there is a future hope for you, and your hope will not be cut off if you find it. See the contingents there? 1 Samuel 13, one of my favorite ones. This is when uh, Saul had been disobedient. He had been repeatedly disobedient. He was God's chosen, 
as the leader of Israel, but he disobeyed repeatedly, and he grieved God. And yet he also ends up being judged by God, and this prophet is confronting Saul and speaking to him. He says, you have done a foolish thing, Samuel says, the prophet. He's talking to Saul. He says, you have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. Now, here's what I want you to get. It's very, very important. I have it in yellow, so you'll catch it, see? He says, if you had, if you had what? If you had kept the command. He's saying, if you had kept the command, if you had, he would have. So this is very important because what he's saying is that God was working in terms of contingencies regarding Samuel, I mean Saul, in his reign and rule of Israel. And he's telling him, this is what I would have done if you had not been so stupid and disobedient and stubborn and arrogant. If you had not squandered the opportunity that I gave you, essentially, if you, he says, I would have, this is so powerful. He says, I would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. That's God saying it. It's not negotiable. It's not like, well, I don't know how you're interpreting that. No, I'm going to interpret it just like it says it. He says, I would have established your kingdom forever. What is he saying? He's saying the messianic line, that's always the phraseology for Messiah who's prophesied to come to Israel. He's saying the messianic line would have come off of the line of Saul rather than David. I would have established your kingdom forever. Jonathan knew that. Jonathan was Saul's son and David's best friend. And yet Jonathan stepped back knowing that knowing that the kingdom had been ruined and that it had been snatched from his dad and that he would have been the rightful heir to the line of Messiah. Jonathan, Jonathan's role in the future has been erased essentially by his father's disobedience. It's very tragic. So you sense that tragedy as, as Samuel's confronting Saul. And he says, if you had... He would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of the people because you have not kept the Lord's command. <clears throat> Here's a simple one in James. We might use this one tonight in prayer. He says, James is saying, Therefore confess your sins to the people in the church. Confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous person is powerful and effective. So he's saying that there are conditions even for some types of healing. He's saying, you know, call for the elders of the church, anointing them with oil, praying the prayer of faith in the name of the Lord Jesus. He says, but as you confess your faults to one another, he says, pray for one another that you may be healed. Meaning that if you don't go through this process, you may not be healed. <clears throat> you see the counterfactuals? Now here's my best one, my favorite one of all. This is the most tender of all counterfactuals in the Bible. To me, it's one of the most amazing statements, and that's Jesus himself standing before Jerusalem at the end of his ministry. He looks over Jerusalem and he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. So what an amazing passage because Jesus, number one, is putting himself in the role of Yahweh in first person. He's saying the relationship I had with Israel, that was me. And I was there all along. And I sent prophets to you. I sent a voice of truth. I sent the word to you. And you stoned them and you rejected them. And it, it broke the heart of God because what he's expressing here is how much I wanted, this is a very affectionate expression, I wanted to take you under my wing as a hen does her chicks. It's very, very affectionate. I, it was my heart all along for Israel. This is what I wanted, but you wouldn't do it. That's why we have to be careful when we talk about America. If we collective reject God and the Christian consensus is completely broken, unless God comes with an act of mercy, a spirit of awakening and revival, 
you, you, you may not understand, but one of, the, one of the great judgments is that God just withdraws. So I, I'm done. My belief is that America is still God's, and He hasn't withdrawn. So I have great hope. But I'm under no illusions in the sense from a theological standpoint. Israel, Israel after they comp- continually rejected, they were eventually a divided kingdom. And there were many consequences to their rebellion. So I'm not under any illusions to think that somehow we've got a free pass as Americans. But I'll tell you what, that's why tonight I want to pray. Because I do believe prayer makes a difference. And we can call upon God to bring mercy on America. Right? I don't think he's walked away. And I think he's hearing God's people. But I don't think we, you know, we can step back and go, oh, well, God's sovereign. He'll do whatever he wants. No, I think to some extent there's a ball in our court. There's a ball in the court of every judge's court and how they're finding courage to respond and courage to see. And so I, I was on a Facebook thread yesterday, day before, and somebody made the comment. They were talking about kind of things that have happened in the U.S. over the last few months, and people were distressed about it. The post, original post was distressed. And listen, I'm distressed. I think God is distressed. Doesn't mean I walk, you know, in fear or that I'm, you know, crying every day. But I have cried. I think God is crying. And I think He is laboring with us to bring about a better outcome. But I'm not, gonna, I'm not under any illusions. I don't care what the prophets are saying. We're in trouble as a people. And we need to understand that so that it affects the way we pray and the way we cry out to God. So on this Facebook thread, somebody responds flippantly. I thought it was flippant. It's like dismissive of everything that people were sharing where their concerns and they're sharing their heart. And somebody says, well, God is in control. And I made the statement on there. God is not in control of everything. I rarely ever say those phrases because people use it as a dismissive comment. Yes, God is in control of the universe and He is the supreme sovereign, but He is not in control of all my choices or your choices. Is He? Are we puppets? Is He the grand puppeteer and He's orchestrating and everything is happening exactly? Of course not. Not from a biblical standpoint. So, hmm, I'm not getting too heavy for y'all. Getting deep, huh? Okay, so here we go. So Jeanette and I, talking about counterfactuals, child number four (laughs) weighs heavy on a family. You're like, okay, is child number four here this morning? Oh, there she is, okay. (laughs) Okay, so child number one, no problem. Child number two, no problem. Child number three, Okay, got that. But child number four. So Jeanette felt real strong we need to have child number four. I'm like, I don't know. (laughs) Hey, I I grew up in a family of two. She grew up in a family of five, so I felt like three was a compromise. (laughs) It's going to be expensive. It's not that expensive in the beginning when all you have to cover is diapers, but there's a trajectory. Teenagers. They all become teenagers. <laughs> okay. So uh, she says, felt it so strong. She says to me one day, she says, Okay, you're going to Victoria. I was on a business trip. You're going to Victoria. You've got an hour and a half from Portland, an hour and a half. She says, uh, I think you need to pray about this. And I think, I think you need to. Are you willing? If God has put this in my heart and he's saying we need to have number four, are you willing? So how am I going to say no? Am I going to say no, I'm not willing? God, you know, I mean, God, it's our destiny to have number four. See, Alicia, we have all these discussions about you. (laughs) And so I'm on my way to Victoria and I say, Lord, of course I'm willing if it's through your heart and your desire and it's our destiny and it's what you're wanting to do, I don't want to stand in the way. I don't want to hinder what you're doing. Then so be it. She's pregnant. Boom, within like two days. 
I'm at H-E-B, you know, Saturday morning going to get that pregnancy test. Hate that feeling. You know, they didn't have, they didn't have self-check at that time. So you're walking through the cashier's going, hmm? Let me know, you know. So... So I can't imagine our lives without Alicia now. That decision was a legacy decision. That decision affected, it had a domino effect like the bookcases. Boom, 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 boom. Right? It has a domino effect. That single decision affects so many other decisions. It opens up so many other possibilities. And I couldn't imagine what our lives would be like without Alicia. Because then we wouldn't have Jay. And then we'd be missing four grandkids. I mean, and then it just cascades like that. And you think, oh my goodness, our lives would be so, I mean, you know, we wouldn't even know what we were missing. We would have had no idea what we were missing. We would have functioned with the three children we already had, and we would go with the Lord, and we would continue going. But that's why it's so important. A lot of times we don't know what the counterfactual is. We don't know what our lives would have looked like. I can now look back retrospectively, retrospectively and I can say, I can see the gap. I can see why it was so important that we obeyed God in number four. So a lot of parents, they just go, well, you know, I'll meet with these couples, premarital counseling. So how many kids do y'all want to have? Well, I think maybe two. I, I think maybe one. I don't know, three's a bit much. You know, they'll be just kind of giving their opinions. And I'm like, so... What does the Lord want? What if he wants five? It's too late, honey. <laughs> I saw Victoria back there laughing. Five is not happening. Well, I don't know, Abraham. <laughs> so, okay, I have a bonus clip for you this morning. So many battles waged over the years. Oh, wait. This is the answer. Oh, it says here. I never showed the other one, did I? Sorry. We can show them both. 10 04 p.m. next Saturday night. If we could somehow harness this lightning, channel it into the flux capacitor, it just might work. Next Saturday night, we're sending you back to the future. Okay, all right, Saturday's good, Saturday's good. I can spend a week in 1955, I can hang out, you can show me around. Marty, that is completely out of the question. You must not leave this house. You must not see anybody or talk to anybody. Anything you do could have serious repercussions on future events. Do you understand? Yeah, sure, okay. Marty, have you interacted with anybody else today besides me? I'm... Yeah, well, I might have sort of bumped into my parents. Great Scott! Let me see that photograph again of your brother. Uh, just as I thought. This proves my theory. Look at your brother. His head's gone. It's like, it's like it's been erased. Erased from existence. erased from existence okay so i uh, actually had another clip from x-men we'll go ahead and play that too i skipped it so earlier many tonight. battles waged over the years and yet none of them like this are we destined to destroy each other or can we change who we are and unite is the future truly set Okay, so there it is. Is the future truly set? And I was already talking about how the entire plot line of that particular X-Men was centered around that idea. Um, so a lot of times our, our future is determined by a lot of micro decisions. Many, many thousands and thousands of little decisions. So for instance, if I gain, so for instance, if I gain a pound every month, 
oh, a pound this month, no big deal. But if it becomes a trajectory in 36 months, I weigh 36 pounds more, right? And then add that to year after year, and it's many, many, many micro decisions. And so we all realize that. We all kind of like, yeah, but I like my micro decisions the way they are. So what's 36 pounds anyway? See? But the point is, is that, is that the many, many decisions we make on more consequential levels, you know, I was, I was reading a while back that it's changing one single habit, smoking, can literally add 10 years to your life. And you know, I wish, I wish Rush Limbaugh hadn't smoked for so many years because he has terminal lung cancer now. He's 70 years old. I wish we had him 10 more years. Maybe we will. I mean, people are praying for him, but it's going to take a miracle. But he's, he's literally suffering the consequences of all these years that he did previously. He always would talk about his formerly nicotine-stained hands, right? So it's been many years, but the damage was done. So a lot of times we are arrogant. We're just thinking we're young and we're immortal, and so we're taking on these habits and we don't realize that we are destroying ourselves or we're cutting our lives short and uh, so in his case you know we will all all of us all of us that I think is one of the most brilliant conservative analysts out there other people recoil at that because they've never listened to him but the fact is that that 10 years we could really use right now so choices matter there are consequences um, so I have a notable thought for you. This is me quoting myself. Choices that we make today, whether good or bad, will directly lead to a new set of options and circumstances otherwise not available tomorrow. A decision that we make today can have an impact on the entire set of future circumstances presented to us in the distant future. The domino effect. Here's the concern I have in teaching what I am this morning is that we'll end up walking on eggs through life. Oh, man, I just made a micro decision. I think my life's ruined. <laughs> man, Jeanette bought some ice cream last night. Whew, man. I carefully, tread carefully and reverently as I ate the ice cream. So, but, but I, you know, my concern, and I don't walk on eggs through life. I do trust God. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord because he delights in his way. So we, can't, we cannot micromanage our own lives and try to anticipate everything. There's grace that God brings to us. I shared some time back how the Lord had spoken to Jeanette when she was 17 that she would marry a preacher five years, in, in five years. Five years later, she marries me. I didn't look like much of a preacher, but here, see? And so, but she could have, even, even though she didn't live her life just right, even though she wasn't making every decision and crossing every T and dotting every I, God's grace extended in that promise with a lot of latitude. In other words, she was able to make some mistakes that you would think could have sabotaged that plan. And I believe she could have if she had pushed too hard and pushed those guardrails too hard. Then God would improvise a new plan for me. But what I'm saying is that, is, that, is that there's grace for us as we proceed through life, as our hearts are His. What did Jesus say? Seek first His kingdom. The kingdom meaning His rule, His reign, His government in our lives. You seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. You want to live uh, right in right standing with God. And he says, and all these things, all these particulars will be added to you. God is going to be involved in your life in providing and taking care of a lot of things and opening up doors and, and working with you in partnership to help you navigate life, which can be hard sometimes. So, but it makes sense to get this right on the front end of your life because you have, like I was talking about, that 10-year window where young adults are making all these crucial decisions. You want to get it right, right in there. But later in life, what about that? And I'm, we're going to look at that. How do you restore a lost legacy? We're going to get to that in the series. There's seven parts, so I can't cover it all today. But I'm giving you hope that we're going to deal with how to restore a legacy lost and what can God do and this kind of thing. So 
Um, but I think what the earlier in life we can get some of this right, the fewer regrets we'll have later. Can't go back and change the past. Can't change anything. Sometimes you might think, if I could only get a redo, if I could get a reset. I mean, I, I thought about the accident I had up on that mountain the other day going down the steep hill. And I, you know, had moments of regret. I probably thought, gosh, you know what I subjected everybody to by having the accident and having to be up there at night so late and so many hours. And I had a group of, you know, eight young people with me. And, and they're just fabulous. They're wonderful. They're patient. They're working with me. We, we're all improvising. We're, we're pulling together as a team. We're going to make this work when we get down that mountain. But I can tell you there was a moment where I'm, we're pretty close to the top of this area we were hiking off trail. And I looked out. Somebody made a comment about they could see the lights of the, like the civilized area. They said, let me see. I shouldn't have looked. Because the civilized area was like this big, way off in the distance and way down there. Like way. And I'm like, it never looked farther when I'm going down on my rear. And eventually, human crutches helping me down this mountain. And so I had regrets as I'm going through that. I'm thinking, man, if I could just redo that. And I think back on the hike, and I think if I could have done this differently or that differently. The, the fact is I could have done everything just right and still, still had a twist in my ankle that you don't know. I think of many times I've fallen or slipped and didn't get injured. And in some ways I have to trust God with my life, and I have to look at that and trust God with our whole group and our team out there in the wilderness. And I would think back, how would it have gone if I hadn't had the accident or, you know, kind of regrets. And I think and then there's a the prospect of having to get surgery. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, it's going to throw us off. We, so much is happening in our church, so many new people, all these new people coming in. And so we have momentum. And so I'm going to be laid up. And oh, you can imagine. I've never had surgery in my life. I learned a colonoscopy. Too much information. <laughs> so I'm sitting here like, man, this is, this is. But what do you do? You have to, I can't, I can't live in the regret of an accident. I have to look forward. And it's, this is a microcosm of our lives. And so I want to caution you not to be living in regret, but begin to have a teachable spirit and say, Lord, now from this point going forward, what do I do? How do I improvise? How do I, how do I please you going forward? How do, I, how do I set my life in motion now from this day forward? in a way that will please you, in a way that you can bless.